Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's seminar. Our speaker today is Professor Ines Altevedo from, uh, she's a professor with the Energy Resources Engineering. Uh, she's going to talk about marginal emissions and damage factors uh, today. And just a quick reminder, our next seminar is in two weeks. Uh, Shabai is going to talk about uh, uh, EV charging behavior. Okay, yeah. I'm ready. So it's great to be again in this, um, this seminar series. Um, I, I think I spoke into it um, in one of the previous quarters, if not, if not last quarter. Um, and, and so um, I'm an associate professor in the Department of Energy Resources Engineering, working uh, mostly on uh, sustainable energy systems and looking at transitions both for the power sector, uh, for um, electrified vehicles, um, and with a lot of the work focusing on the United States related transitions, and now more recently also um, starting to work on India-related issues for the decarbonization. Um, and um, I'm um, honored to also be a senior fellow for the Hoods Institute for the Environment, as well as for uh, the Precourt uh, Energy Institute, and now co-leading the Beats and Watts initiative with Ramana Raghupal. Um, and prior to that, in my, in my previous life, I was a professor at Carnegie Mellon University in the Department of Engineering and Public Policy. And um, today I'll be talking, this is gonna be a little bit of a walk on memory lane because this is work that started um, around 2010 on uh, marginal emissions and damage factors. And so putting this in terms of the, the question and uh, the formulation is, is as follows. So as, as we think about any sorts of intervention, think about adding uh, solar or wind into the grid or an electric vehicle, the question that we asked at the time is uh, really, what are the emissions reductions or emissions added for both greenhouse gases as well as criteria pollutants? as you add or remove those sorts of new loads or uh, generation in the grid. And so in order to understand that, we'll need to um, have an understanding of how the rest of the grid changes as we pursue those interventions. So there will be some power plants that will need to ramp up and others that will need to provide uh, additional power as we uh, plug in an uh, electric vehicle to, um, to be charged as you add solar and wind, maybe some of those other power plants will scale back and ramp down and not be needed to provide power. How can we track those sorts of changes so that we can provide a more robust estimate of the emissions consequences associated with those implications? So in terms of the big picture, energy services are the largest contributor to greenhouse gases, in particular from transportation and electricity. And the source of questions, this framework was developed to answer a whole suite of questions. And the questions um, include things like, should we add more solar in California or in Pennsylvania? And we'll get back to this one. Are we helping the environment if we choose a battery electric car, or is it more beneficial to actually select an hybrid, depending on the location where you are? What are the uh, largest environmental, climate change, and health benefits from uh, increasing wind energy in different locations? And are we really helping the environment by adding storage to our electricity grid? And the questions that we explore, so all of those are examples of papers that then came out using this framework. Think about video streaming strategies on Netflix, Hulu, and so on. Um, could we use that as a climate mitigation strategy by shifting uh, the, uh, the way the loads uh, uh, of these data centers are operating across regions so that we take advantage of regions where you have a lower carbon emission footprint to be routing those services at different uh, um, points in time. So the overall umbrella is, is really how do these different interventions 
um, affect the emissions and damages, and I'll get back to what I mean by damages uh, from the US electric grid. And this is important because if we just pick one number on a CO2 uh, nationwide average emissions factor, we're really masking some key differences that we have regionally. Um, this one is already dated, but we, uh, we have developed also a tool that's not the one I'll be talking about today um, that computes the quarterly um, emissions factor for every single state and nationwide, as well as the electricity mix tracked uh, close as much as real time as possible, given um, the outputs of the Environmental Protection Agency data. But, but what you see is that talking just a, about an average number for the grid across the US will potentially to decisions of uh, electrifying of uh, the avoided emissions thanks to renewables and so on, that would mask really the displacement of emissions that we're having different locations. And this is for CO2, but we care also about other types of pollutants. So for power plant operations from fossil fuels, in addition to CO2 emissions, um, power plants such as coal um, still are associated with large amounts of SO2, NOx uh, emissions, as well as direct P, uh, PM2.5 emissions. Those types of pollutants have very strong implications in terms of premature mortality, leading to premature deaths due to um, health problems. Indeed, um, the emissions and resulting exposure to both direct PM2.5 as well as secondary formation of PM2.5 that arises from the emissions of SO2, NOx, and other pollutants um, is the major um, global and US health risk in terms of cause of mortality per year. And here the dynamics are very different from that of greenhouse gases. So in greenhouse gases, we have a ton of emissions, the pollutant will be very well mixed across the globe, will persist for um, decades to several centuries, depending on the gas and the fraction that will still remain in the atmosphere versus in one of the sinks. Um, and the damages from climate change are um, difficult to attribute with precision to one location. So they will be global and over the long term. But when we think about these types of other pollutants, uh, like the criteria pollutants like SO2, it's a very different story. So what uh, this is uh, showing in this plot, and this is from a, a model output from a colleague, Nick Mueller, um, just for illustration, is that the damages to health in terms of causing premature mortality and then monetizing that value, transforming it into dollars, we'll, we'll go over that too may range from $1,000 per ton of SO2 all the way to $15,000 for the same ton of pollutants. Why the difference? Well, it will depend on where um, the ton of pollutant is generated in terms of the stack high geographical location, the dispersion of that pollutant and the reactions uh, in the atmosphere forming secondary PM2.5, and then it will depend on how the additional ton of emissions contributes to an increase in concentration of PM2.5, as well as to exposure. So think about it uh, like this, a coal power plant in the middle of uh, nowhere with the wind blowing in regions that also don't have um, uh, many people, there's not gonna be any major effects in terms of premature mortality. A coal power plant just upwind of a major population center, again, same ton of emissions, but the consequences for exposure will be much larger. And that drives the sorts of differences that we're seeing over here in the map. Excuse me, is there a density associated with how many tons per how much is that area? Um, uh, how many? How, how many tons per square mile are we talking about? So uh over here is just a ton uh, of SO2 out of the stack. We'll see the change in terms of concentration of average PM 
So getting more at the issue, not of the mass needed, but actually the concentration in just a little bit. Okay. So um, the tying this together to the issue of the timing of those emissions, the emissions of CO2 and these other criteria pollutants are going to depend on which power plant is operating at the margin and how we dispatch the different power plants. So this figure is uh, mostly for illustration and not representing one real system. But on the vertical axis, we have the marginal cost of producing electricity by these different plants, which is closely associated to their fuel costs. And on the horizontal axis, we have the amount of demand for uh, electricity that we'll have in a certain hour. And so in a simplified way and ignoring transmission constraints and, and so on, the way the plants will be dispatched is from low operation costs to high uh, and marginal operation costs. And so you'll see that plants such as hydropower and so on will come here um, towards the left of the plot, um, followed by things like nuclear and then coal and natural gas with the ordering of coal and natural gas, depending on what are the coal prices and what are the natural uh, gas prices and actually in the cheap natural gas prices, as we've seen the order kind of reverses and has even led to the retirement of uh, coal power, uh, several coal power plants. Now, that's the way the plants are dispatched, but now their implications in terms of emissions across the plants are going to be quite different. So you have uh, the, the, here the vertical axis is the emission intensity of CO2 per megawatt up, uh, hour. And for hydro, that's, that's zero. And then you may have some coal power plants that have high uh, emissions factors and natural gas uh, power plants that have um, kind of half the value of, of those of coal power plants. And so what happens? If you're doing a demand side intervention or the charging of an electric vehicle or adding solar or wind to the grid that is producing a certain amount or displacing a certain amount of electricity in um, this particular point in time where the demand was close to 12 gigawatts, the plant emissions that you are effectively displacing or inducing is a natural gas power plant. If instead your intervention is occurring at the time where demand was around gigawatt hours for, for that hour, maybe what you're doing is inducing or removing the emissions of a coal power plant. So how can we track those things? Well, it turns out that we're very fortunate that in the United States, there are publicly available data sets um, that allow us to do quite a little bit in that regard. So the modeling strategy and this continued over time and, and being refined and updated was to one model to US grid. So identifying the plants that are operating at the margin and their characteristics. The second step is that um, we and policymakers probably won't care as much about the emissions consequences. We care about the consequences of the emissions. Um, that entails going from um, emissions of a pollutant to the increase in concentration to exposure and to understanding what are the, the damages in terms of premature mortality or a dollar value associated with those losses so that we can understand which public policies to pursue that are cost-effective at reducing those same damages. And finally, we use this strategy to model how different types of energy interventions change the baseline health, environmental, and climate change damages. So in light of this, and just opening up for a conversation with all of you too, let's think about the case of, should we add more solar in California or in Pennsylvania? So assume that you're a central decision maker and that can allocate subsidies for one region versus another. What would be re uh, reasons to allocate that funding to California or to Pennsylvania? That come to mind, yes. On one hand, California is linear, so you might be able to have a more generation capacity with like less square feet of 
solar panels, but you might displace more coal in Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. So so right now the solar resource is likely we'll look at this and probably you've seen this in other seminars, but uh, better in California, uh, but Pennsylvania has still a substantial uh, share of coal in the electricity generation mix. So maybe the uh, emissions that you're avoiding, despite the fact that the resource is not so good, are better in Pennsylvania. We'll see. Uh, were you having the same point already? Okay. Uh, yeah. So what about that also depend on the generation mix? <clears throat> so for instance, you could have more solar in Pennsylvania, but coal are very good load, load following uh, supply, right? So in some ways, if you add solar with that intermittency, you can't run up and down the coal, so it might actually contribute that well. Yeah, that's right on. And so in the next slide, hopefully we'll address your question by um, exactly tracking how plants are behaving in terms of going up and down from one hour to the next under different levels of demand. And actually we have now a project uh, that is starting with, uh, also with Jack uh, Schallender who was here uh, as a speaker on understanding how large uh, amounts of renewables may change that dynamics exactly because only some plants are able to go ramp up and down to accommodate that, that change. So that's a great question. Um, so and, and please keep those coming so, so, so that it's not just me talking. Um, so how do we estimate um, this uh, environmental health and climate change benefits? So for every single uh, county in the United States, we have information on the damages uh, per ton of pollutants and by stack height for each different pollutant. So for SO2, NOx, and PM2.5. This comes from an air quality model. I can't recall if I have a figure uh, here, but it ties back to this sort of variation in damages per ton of pollutant emission. What this sort of air quality models, those are reduced form air quality models that um, have across them, we actually use three of them nowadays and compare the results uh, for, for our research given that they have different formulations. AP2, which actually is now in the AP3 version, uh, what it does is that it looks at the Gaussian plume and has some very simplified chemistry to understand what the concentration of one ton across the entire continent, continental United States would be. So the, one of the things that I've shown previously in this seminar uh, series is that this sort of emissions really carry over from the stack of power plants to other states, right? They don't remain between state boundaries. So you may have um, a large amount of premature mortality, for example, in the state of New York is actually attributable to emissions from other places, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and so on. Um, so mapping out that information um, is kind of the first step. Um, the AP2 and these uh, other uh, reduced form models both include a dispersion of the pollutants, the resulting concentration across all US counties for every single source of additional ton of pollution from a stack of every single power plant. And then they couple that with those response functions that represent the physical impacts in terms of premature mortality, as well as some environmental impacts. But I'll note that the health damages are by far the largest amount of damages when we, uh, when we contrast those, at least in terms of um, dollar, though that comes also with several set of assumptions. And then for health impacts, um, what uh, is done is to multiply the premature mortality by a value of a statistical life, which at the time of the first analysis that I'm referring to here were 6 million, those numbers are being updated. <coughs> So what's the value of a statistical life? That reflects the way in which uh, all of us face different types of risks. This is estimates that have been done uh, mostly by economists in the labor literature that associate the types of uh, risks with um, uh, risks in the profession with uh, uh, wages and salaries and how much risk is being tolerated. So that yet again, 
comes with a bunch of assumptions because not everyone has the same flexibility of changes in jobs, even if the risk level um, is, is large. And they try to control for that. So uh, from the AP2 model in this case and similar models for more recent analysis, we would have the damages per ton of source pollution. Then for CO2, as I mentioned, it is a, a well-mixed pollutant that will be long-lasting. And so at the time of this analysis, again, way back when, we used $20 per 10 ton of CO2 to reflect the social cost of carbon. This was at the number at the time suggested by the US Interagency Working Group. So what this reflects is the damages to health, to ecosystems, to everything that may arise uh, due to climate change. And uh, folks get that these numbers by room, uh, running also integrated assessment models um, that look at these damages over the course of several generations on time horizons. So for uh, 1,400 plants, we would have the location, fuel type, stack height, and hourly emissions from CO2, SO2, NOx, and PM2.5. And so this is where the publicly available data comes into play. And I, I, I do hope that at some point this is available for many other regions across the globe, which is something um, that the Environmental Protection Agency here in the US puts together called the SEMS uh, data set. The SEMS data set provides hourly emissions and hourly generation for every single power plant in the United States that is fossil fuel based and larger than 25 megawatts. And this goes back for many years, right? So when we started looking at it, we're using um, data from 2009 and data up until 2021 is already available for download. So um, one of the things that SEMS does not include is the direct emissions of PM2.5. So for that, we have to rely on another data set, the National Emissions Inventory, that puts the, those uh, um, estimates together every four or five years. And again, we now have updated all of that to the most recent one, uh, uh, the most recent NEI, but for sake of understanding how we got there, I'm showing what we did at the time. Now, how can we get at the change in emissions and changes in damages? Well, the first thing that we do is that we parse out the data into regions that operates reasonably independently of each other so that we um, don't so that we can exclude any sort of major imports or exports that would be used to meet demand in other neighboring regions. And so we use the e-grid subregions that are shown in the map. And for every one of these subregions and for each pollutant, we look at the hourly damages in dollars per hour as the damages per ton times the amount of emissions that each power plant was providing at that hour. And next, we do a regression. So we relate the change in damages with the change in generation. So to your point, this allows for us to understand how the damages and emissions, so we do this for, for both, will be changing as demand fluctuates, in this case, generation, fluctuates up and down. So um, let me zoom in. This is for ERCOT, so for Texas, and just on the damages associated with SO2 emissions, which will lead to uh, an increased concentration of secondary PM 2.5. And so again, vertical axis is the change in, in damages from one hour to the next, the horizontal axis, the change in generation, and what we see here is that at uh, hours of low demand, the emissions of uh, uh, SO2 um, are increasing, uh, are higher than uh, in hours of low demand. So what's going on here? In areas of low demand, there could be that there were some at the time coal and uh, even some oil uh, plants that were operating at the margin. Whereas in the hours in, of high demand, natural gas was at the margin, and so there was no damage induced uh, during those uh, portions of the time. Yeah. Um, in the model, are you assuming that um, solar power is prioritized over, over coal at that moment? Or that right? 
So we, we, we don't assume, we, we observe. So all of this, all the, all the dots are actually the behavior that was observed on um, damages, on emissions, and we have plant type. So when I say that uh, this, this, was the, this profile over here is due to coal and some oil plants is because we're able to backtrack actually which type of plants were going up and down in that specific hour. So this is something that we see from the data that rather than making any assumptions. So we're not doing any simulations. We're doing regressions on the historical data that was observed at the time. And that's a good question. I guess I'm, I, I, I'm curious to understand more about that graph because I imagine that most grids use coal as a base of supply. Mm -hmm. And so the damages would, would increase if you're adding natural gas as your peak or versus sort of remaining lower as it seems like they're doing on that side. Yeah, though I'll say that things aren't changing in that regard, right? So you do have also coal serving as fast ramping in some instances. Mm -hmm. So meaning all of that, in addition to to all of these layers, is is pretty uh, quite price driven to some extent. Um, but and you're right. So meaning we have here a mix of also single cycle natural gas peakers that actually were built a little bit earlier on in the early 2000s and that have higher emissions intensity for NOx, for example, and then some single, uh, some combined cycle natural gas power plants more efficient also in some, so all of that is kind of embedded on what we see coming out in terms of emissions and damages from, from this data. Now, so um, what what is going on? Well, um, Basically, we're tracking uh, that in an hour for uh, where the demand was 12 gigawatts, the all the demand uh, is leading to this sort of integral uh, for the total carbon emissions that are produced in this hour. And as we pursue some sort of intervention, we're trying to capture this difference. So as we introduce a little bit of solar, a little bit of wind, we're trying to see, okay, how has the system behaved previously, and that's what we are referring to the regressions, when demand went uh, down from one hour to the next by this amount. And that's what we use as uh, a factor uh, in terms of the change in emissions. So finally, I'll zoom in again uh, on what we found at the time for, for Texas and for SO2 for illustration. What we were able to map, and this was what was produced in the paper in PNAS, was um, the marginal damages in dollars per megawatt hour that are associated with uh, total fossil fuel generation in ERCOT for um, different profiles. So being able now to match this with total generation or demand to understand how the profiles were different depending on the level at which the system was operating. So to... Um, make it clear for what the plot that is showing on the left and the one uh, that is on the right and the linkage between the two. Uh, let's look at SO2 and we see that in hours of low demand, the damage per uh, gigawatt hour associated with uh, electricity generation was this same uh, $90. Um, whereas in the hours of um, low demand, we see that the damages were very uh, small. And we did the same thing for every single region and for every type of pollutant. Now comes the issue of how can we evaluate what happens under different interventions? And so I'll show two cases for wind and solar to start with. Um, so we had uh, simulated data from uh, NREL for uh, a bunch of different um, wind and solar sites across the United States. And this is what it looks like for every single site. So we had um, uh, capacity factors on an hourly basis that were simulated for a typical meteorological year and then also for um, other um, specific years. This one was for the TM, uh, for the typical meteorological year that would show us, okay, for a site in this location, it is likely that the output will be something like this. Now we can use that information to now match 
the generation of wind in that particular hour and observe how the system would behave in terms of reducing or in increasing generation in that same hour and what would be the damages associated with that. So we're basically for this specific hour over here, we see that we had uh, uh, suddenly a drop in wind generation and we could then see, okay, what would be the damages associated with plants that need to increase a little bit their generation to meet up, make up for that change, given how the system had behaved in the past when different types of changes occurred. And finally, we're able to bring all of that together in terms of the damages avoided per megawatt hour of um, uh, wind generation in different locations. So let's jump, we did that strategy, both for solar and then for wind, we had similarly uh, outputs on, um, on the solar irradiance and did exactly the same type of exercise. And so if we revert back to the sort of question that we're asking on, should we add solar in uh, Pennsylvania or in California, let's see what this looks like. So we know that the energy performance uh, is much better in the Southwest, so in, in uh, California, Arizona, New Mexico, where the capacity factors, meaning the same uh, kilowatt of panel, will produce much more electricity in those regions than in other regions. In fact, a solar PV panel in Arizona would produce 45% more electricity than in Maine over the course of a year. But now let's look at the avoided CO2 that is associated with installing that same solar panel across the country. And we're showing that in both kilograms of CO2 uh, avoided, as well as dollars in terms of the avoided damages using the social cost of carbon uh, number of $20. And if we look at it in this perspective, the largest gains to mitigate climate change from adding solar would come in Kansas, Nebraska, and the Dakotas, where the soil resources are moderate. They're not bad, but they are not the best ones across the country, but we're displacing coal intensive coal power plants. And finally, if we look at this in the perspective of uh, avoiding premature mortality from air pollution, yet a different picture emerges because now this is going to be influenced not only by the um, emissions of criteria pollutants, but also by exposure. So the uh, locations of highly densely populated areas will matter. And so as a decision maker, if you want to mitigate the effects associated with premature from mortality from air pollution, we'll look at other regions. And for example, a solar PV in Ohio would be providing 17 times the health and environmental benefits of a solar PV panel in Arizona, even uh, as the solar panel produced 30% uh, less electricity. And this is because coal was at the margin in those areas and upwind of uh, major population centers. Uh, let's look at the same sort of figures, but for wind, uh, here in the case of wind, we know that the largest resources are in the Great Plains and through West Texas. Um, and when we look at the CO2 emissions that are avoided, we see very different pictures from the solar case. Here, the energy uh, performance and the avoided CO2 align quite well, where in the Midwest, both having the very uh, excellent wind resources and um, having uh, coal fire generators being displaced leads to things that are very similar, whether we look at energy or CO2. But once again, for um, premature mortality associated with air pollution, uh, we do see that other locations would be preferable if your goal as a decision maker is to mitigate damages from air pollution. Find that the wind turbine in West Virginia displays seven times the health effects of wind and in Oklahoma and 27 times uh, when compared to California. Now we can go one step further and try to understand for wind installations that had already been built, what are the social benefits that accrue from thanks to having those, those plants? 
And so we did that and calculated that the annual benefits from both mitigating CO2 um, uh, emissions as well as criteria air pollutants were $2.6 billion. So we went and actually looked at the actual output from those uh, wind plants and backtracked the damages that would be avoided thanks to that. And we can compare that to the subsidies that were provided at the time uh, in terms of a production uh, tax credit uh, federally for uh, wind projects, which would amount to 1.6 billion. And so here were some good news, right? The annual benefits that society as a whole was having thanks to the addition of wind were larger than the cost of the subsidy that was provided. But now if we look at things regionally, uh, the, things also become interesting because everyone gets the same PPC uh, level per unit of electricity generated. So $22 uh, dollars per megawatt hour at the time. But the benefits that arise in different states would be tremendously different. Uh, so in California, the subsidy is larger than the damages that it avoids. In Pennsylvania, uh, this, uh, the benefits that you get from uh, installing wind for health and for climate change are much higher than the level of the PPC subsidy. So my question to you is, um, is this fair or should we rethink the design of subsidies and why yes or why not? And I don't have an answer. I mean, again, this is really a, a question as, as decision makers, you could argue in different ways about, uh, about this issue. I mean, the, the, the goal of um, adding wind is, is not only uh, to address climate change, but also in terms of adding and building new infrastructure, potentially jobs, which we ignored completely in the analysis and trade-offs between jobs creators and jobs that disappear. And the, the reason why the PPC subsidy is higher than the damages avoided in California is also California has already spent a lot of effort in terms of decarbonizing and reducing the emissions from its grid. So should it be weighted less or more? So all those questions more for regulation and policy, but they are there, right? And, and folks could, could decide one way or another and the different sets of arguments, yeah. Yeah, I was going to ask if that number has been contrasted to um, the costs associated with sort of transitioning away from coal, right? Because you're closing down plants, this jobs, this repurposing. Um, so we're currently doing quite a little bit of, of that. Um, uh, not as much on the quantification of the jobs in our group, but the changes in terms of costs of infrastructure. So meaning I, I can point you to another seminar from two days ago, looking at the costs of building new infrastructure across uh, the United States when we want to meet um, specific decarbonization goal and how that changes both in terms of the infrastructure locations and net benefits when you explicitly include or exclude the health damages associated with their pollution. Um, and in addition to that, we've been doing a lot of work still uh, reflecting some of these uh, methods on environmental justice consequences across different types of regions as we adopt different types of um, energy technologies, which is, I think, a, a good segue into this. Um, this was another paper, but building on this and looking at um, the air pollution damages that would be uh, avoided by a solar PV, but over time. So we we're showing how over time the benefits actually got reduced because the intensity of the grid was lower. And so what had, was being displaced was decreasing at the same time. Um, this is yet a similar set of figures just showing for different pollutants how the um, damages avoided by one kilowatt of solar change from 2006 to 2014, again, relying on the SEMS data. Not only that, I don't think I have a figure for this, but we also looked at how these benefits were distributed by county, by demographics in terms of income. I'll provide um, just another example thinking now about, okay, is, <laughs> is storage green? or is storage not a green strategy for us to pursue? And so what 
What do you think? Yes. Yeah? Why is that? Because then we can get more non-renewable uh, energy from the environment rather than using the natural gas and coal. Okay, so if we pair up storage specifically with renewables, right, to provide from power, it's kind of a, a non-brainer that that would be emissions reducing uh, more likely. Um, any reasons why this may not happen? Storage yeah. is pretty expensive. It's expensive, so there is the issue of deployment. That those, um... So, yeah, the cost of mining for bad Okay, so there are all those environmental impacts that we're ignoring associated with uh, with mining. That's that's definitely true. Uh, but let's look just at the operation side and 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 the grid. And once again, relying on the sorts of marginal emissions and damage factors. So let's think about uh, about this. Like the the Storage Act um, in twenty thirteen proposed changes to the uh, Internal Revenue Code so that energy storage would also have an investment credit similar to other um, uh, renewable and low carbon technologies. And in California, uh, the Senate passed AD uh, 2514, directing the California Public Utility Commissions to determine the appropriate amount of grid energy storage that would be needed. And indeed, by 2013, the California Public Utility Commission mandated the three major investor-owned utilities that they would need to have 1.3 gigawatts of storage by 2020, which I think has been met. Now, will storage potentially increase rather than decrease emissions? And the answer is yes, depending on how it is operated. Um, storage is used for different types of services from frequency regulation to uh, energy arbitrage. And the way energy arbitrage works is that storage will charge when prices are low, usually at night, and coal will be at the margin in several uh, regions across the country. And then discharges and disuse um, during the peak afternoon or evening periods when natural gas is at the margin, right? All these dynamics are also changing as coal is being retired and as we have more natural gas and, uh, and renewables. So the actual uh, net contribution of storage will depend on the grid where you're at. But if you use average emissions factor, you simply assume that your storage is associated with zero emissions when you're charging and discharge. Um, but the storage technologies, in addition to the time of charging, also experience losses as they store and recover energy. So a little bit more of electricity is needed. Uh, for that, and therefore an, an additional penalty in emissions. So in this work, we used, again, the marginal emissions factors. We didn't go all the way through the damages and developed a revenue maximizing uh, linear programming optimization model to simulate um, uh, players in the model that would use energy arbitrage. So they will buy and charge a device when the prices or LMPs are low and then sell it when the price are, are, are high. And we did that under both perfect and imperfect information or forecast of what the prices would be. And again, I'll highlight that this is changing because our grid is rapidly changing in terms of the baseline emissions. Uh, this was using the grid back in 2015. And we saw that uh, in some instances, there could be some annual uh, revenue from the storage devices, but that virtually everywhere using storage for energy arbitrage would increase CO2 emissions, not decrease. It would increase uh, NOx emissions with the exception of some regions where it would lead to, to um, a decrease. And same thing for SO2 emissions, it would be at least zero or higher. So as uh, policymakers are deciding on specific scales of storage to be added in the grid. Equally important is the definition of how are the storage services used uh, in a way that doesn't produce unintended consequences for the emissions purpose, in particular if they are um, aimed at reducing the emissions. So one of the things that my group has done over the years, this whole work started um, 
uh, Beck, still at Carnegie Mellon, and the PhD student Kyle Salary Evans, um, and then continued on with the participation of several other PhD students. And uh, we put together an online tool that all of you uh, can use and that we try to keep uh, updating, where you can select what sort of factor you want to look at, whether it's average or marginal emissions factor, whether you want the output to be the results of the regressions of the sort that I described slightly different and evolved over time as explained in the documentation, or as the basis of, we will also this, uh, uh, develop a simulation model, we dispatch off plans and contrast what emissions factors we get out of those simulations rather than looking at historical. And you can do by hour of day and then by state or agreed region or balancing area. And you can look at this in terms of just damages or emissions and using three different types of air pollutant uh, 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 models. And you can download all of this as um, CSV files for your own analysis uh, uh, and assessment of implications of different types of interventions. Um, the goal is really to have this being used, understanding the limitations of the different types of tools that, that are out there still, but so that one can inform better decision-making as um, decisions and policies are designed. With all of that said, I highlighted some uh, situations where we found counterintuitive results. This by no means means that we should stop the transition to low carbon uh, and sustainable energy systems. We need a massive infrastructure transition to renewables, to storage, uh, and to uh, having uh, other types of portfolios of energies that help us get there uh, in a reliable way. We also need, there's some work that we did earlier on showing an increase in emissions of electrified vehicles in some regions across the country. And we're definitely seeing that electrification in countries like India is actually increasing emissions given the very large coal base on the generation. So those things need to be happening at the same time for mitigation goals to, to be met. What we do want to highlight with these sorts of tools is that we now have data and mechanisms to start doing much more careful decisions and planning to make sure that these transitions are indeed achieving the emissions re the reductions that, that we need. The second point, and I'll get to your question, I won't forget about it, um, um, is that sometimes we'll have different answers if we look just at climate policy and ignore the air pollution size of things or other externalities and damages that may also shape the societal outcome. And so focusing on at least those two major ones, uh, climate change and air pollution together, is important because it may change your uh, decision making. We found that location, temporal patterns, and behavior uh, are all important in de determining the health, environmental, and climate change outcomes and interventions. I do also want to highlight that as we put together these sort of uh, marginal emissions factors, MEFs, or marginal damage factors, there are plenty of limitations on its use too. And if you do decide to use these sort of data sets for your analysis, um, I would love to talk more about that too. Uh, but in a nutshell, they are being designed to model small interventions in the grid, not large ones where the system completely changes overnight. So for that, other type of modeling tools are needed that account for changes in the capacity and in the fleet over the next decade. So that's one, one important limitation. The other one is that this becomes harder and harder to model in terms of changes as we have more renewables, given that the generation, the hourly generation and emissions from SAMS are only for fossil fuel based, but uh, the Environmental Protection Agency and the DOE are now also making available um, hourly generation or even some hourly for other uh, for renewables, for example, so we can start using that. And hopefully, Jack showed a little bit on that in the last uh, uh, seminar. So with that, I'll open on um, questions for a little bit. I think this was the last slide. Yeah. So when you, when you go to that slide where it talked about the energy storage for arbitrage being more carbon intense, would, would it be 
similar? I know you kind of mentioned it with like electric vehicles, but is it would it be similar along the lines of like electric vehicles versus gas? I know gas wasn't included in that because there's not really like regular gasoline power yeah. plants, but sort of similar approach, but the numbers would differ given the carbon emissions intensity of gasoline and diesel and the fact that they're, they, they will be emitted at the ground level. So that we model that separately. So the dispersion at ground level will be um, smaller when compared with the, with the stack. So we did find that um, hybrid or electric vehicles were uh, generally better than a conventional gasoline vehicle across the country, but the mild hybrids just with uh, regenerative braking and so on outperformed battery electric vehicles in some locations. So, yeah. so just to confirm, that's that's because the electric vehicles are charging, assuming the electric vehicles are charging at night, which is when you have that natural gas and coal. That's it's right, John. So it yeah. was and there, but though we, we changed that assumption in the sensitivity analysis. But that, that's right. So we're assuming in the base case, convenience charging, and that means starting charging the vehicle after the last trip of the day. And so once again, in terms of data, uh, the, the, the US has the uh, NHTS survey data that has information for different counties and locations on when the last trip of the day for conventional uh, vehicles is. And you can use that as a proxy on how people <coughs> behave for the charging of the electric vehicles. Yeah. Um, so for the price of the charges, the batteries, like I'm wondering if phase the carbon is tracked, like is it the life cycle emission of the battery as such, or is it like emission from the sources that is delivering to the battery? So here it's just really operation emissions. So we're not accounting for the production of the battery. So that would still add, add on to what we're seeing here. This is just the net emissions associated with charging when coal is on and selling when natural gas or renewables are on and that differential. Yeah. So out of interest, wouldn't, wouldn't, the, wouldn't the reverse actually apply? Because I mean, you have a whole bunch of renewables at like 1 a.m. in the noon, that's when you have that whole negative marginal pricing scenario and it's best to charge then. But at night is when you actually want to have a full battery to supply. Um, so, um, that's a really good question that I think that's why I kept on, on highlighting things are changing. So by the time we were running this, we didn't see that. Um, I think then we did it more recently around 2017 and, and still the results were still holding um, very much so. But as you're saying, meaning under a vast amount of renewables, uh, in particular, if you have a lot of wind, things could change. With solar, it's a little bit more tricky uh, because solar also coincides with the peak, right? On so, so, I think it will depend. It will depend on the load profile. It will depend on the amount of wind versus uh, solar that you have in the generation and how that influences prices. Yeah. Um, sorry, one more question. Go for it. Um, have you guys factored? Uh, time and size into this analysis. So for instance, if you say add, you know, one gigawatt of solar onto a coal-based system, those coal plants are still probably gonna run and they'll be like, coal just running on the side, not necessarily plugged into the grid, for instance, if that's done in like two, like the year, for instance. Um, so is that in fact in it'll- It has not been, if I understand the question, I don't, it hasn't been factored then the this analysis since we're just tracking things as they change with demand we are now looking at um how our hourly capacity factors um have been changing for fossil fuel generation across the country as we have more renewables in the grid but that's ongoing we, we started recently jack and i thinking about this problem there's one question from an online participant. Uh, so I'll read. The, uh, I'll read it for me. I, I, I think I'll it's a, oh, it's shown <laughs> in the screen. Uh, I still need to read it for myself too. So, <laughs> should carbon and pollution intensity um, 
become a market factor when ISOs select to dispatch order versus today. Um, so Oli, we, we actually are about to submit a paper on that and uh, mm -hmm. explaining how the dispatch order and the prices would change when we incorporate those two aspects, uh, actually. Um, and in the same, um, in one of the, the recent dispatch papers, and I'm happy to point you to that, we uh, actually looked at the change in merit order and dispatch when a carbon price was in place, but not the air pollution. Um, but that, you know, I, I think that's the question. This would be something that would indeed provide the right signal. Um, the issue that arises is that all of these values in terms of the pollution intensity, if we want to get all the way to the dollar value, come with a lot of assumptions and judgment values. So for the pollution, if you want to reflect that in some sort of uh, dollar per ton of damages or per megawatt embedded in that is the, the value of statistical life and other things. And for the social cost of carbon, the heated debate of what that should reflect. So to give you a little bit of history, the social cost of carbon uh, was developed under one, uh, under one of the prior administrations, I think this was under Obama, um, as a series of studies that estimated the social cost of carbon using different interagency, um, sorry, different integrated assessment models. And they come, came up with a range of values of use 20 at the time, then they increased to a range and to a new value that was around $36 per ton of CO2, I think in $2017 or something. I may be wrong here. And the value was including global damages from climate change and the low discount rates to bring the dollars from future years to present day conditions. Uh, then under the Trump administration, things very quickly changed by executive order to instead account for only domestic damages from climate change, so only damages that could occur in between U.S. boundaries and a higher discount rate, and suddenly the the um, and and the agencies were not mandated anymore to use the same value for the social cost of carbon across all of them, which I, they were previously. And so instead of using thirty six dollars or whatnot for a social cost of carbon, the values changed to something around three dollars per ton of CO two. So that would be much uh, less um, policies that would be justified under that case. And then um, under the Biden administration, Biden in the first, or I think this was first day of uh, in the office, uh, changed these things back again with an executive order and as to include global damages and the low discount rate that the value increased again. So meaning that it's, th these things can still change quite a little bit both on climate change and the, the um, air pollution consequences, depending on some of the key decisions that are made on how to value some of these consequences. So this was a very long answer to your question. Yeah. Yes. Um, can you go back to the slide where you have like the link for the, the online tool? Sure. I mean, actually, I don't know if this one is working right now. My suggestion is if you go to my page at Stanford and under tools, there will be a link to to the Shiny Apps tool. Okay. Yeah. And uh, feel free to shoot me an email if it's not working or if it's buggy. Yeah. Any more questions? Okay, yeah, thank you very much. Sure. Thank you. Thank you.